Okay, let me go publish it, and that's my fault. I could have sworn I published it. Okay. It should be working now. So if you guys go take a look at it, it should be able to be pulled up. I had him publish the module, which is usually, if I forget something, that's it. Okay. So um, you guys can see for the assignment today, there are some notes for you to complete. So if you open those up, it's going to give you some spots where you're going to um, write down some notes as we go along. There is also at the bottom an exit ticket. So you guys are going to work on that at the end. So please make sure that you get this completed and turned in because it is going to be graded. Um, and I just started grading all of the Manifest Destiny newspapers. So um, this should help you increase your grade. Um, and we're going to be going through the presentation, which is also linked in there in case you guys need anything. But I'm going to give you the answers for the notes. So all you need to do is write them out as we go along. Okay. All right. Let's see if we can get Okay, so the Industrial Revolution, like we talked a little bit about yesterday, is a period between 1750 to 1850. We kind of have what's called the first Industrial Revolution. And then 1850 to present day, we kind of what's called the second Industrial Revolution. And then present day, we kind of um, have what is called the third Industrial Revolution. But really, this period from 1750 to present day, so we're talking about 270 years, is kind of the time frame where humanity goes from being relatively rural, most people working on farms, to becoming an urbanized society where people live in cities and work in factories. So this is a huge transformation for our planet, and it's really going to change the lives of every person living on planet Earth. Um, the Industrial Revolution, just like everything in history, has both good and bad parts with it. So we saw the ability of many more people to live their lives. The average lifespan greatly increased. So if you're living um, prior to 1750, most people on average are living to like 35, 40 years old. And then present day, people are living much, much longer. You know, like in the United States, our average lifespan is into your mid 70s now. So there's really an expansion of kind of how well people are living. A lot more people are being taken out of poverty. They're living better lives. They have better access to food. But there are also negative things that come along with this. Um, we're going to see a huge increase in slavery in the United States because of in the Industrial Revolution. Uh, we have a lot of children being forced to um, work and a lot of like very bad conditions that children are working in. Um, but overall, it's really probably a net benefit for our planet um, in a lot of ways. It, it is also going to lead to a lot of pollution, which, you know, we're kind of suffering from some of the effects on. Um, so the Industrial Revolution is really started by a couple of key things. One of the most important things that's going to happen is this revolution in clothing. So between 1750 and 1850, people are going to be have much more access to clothes. Prior to this, the majority of people, they're wearing clothes that you're making either from buckskin, so from the hide of a deer after you kill it, or you're wearing clothes made of wool. But the development of cotton in the United States and in India is really going to change the types of clothing that people wear. And it's really going to revolutionize um, people's ability to wear different types of clothes. So rather than having just one or two sets of clothing that you're going to wear every day for your whole life, people are going to start having more in different types of clothes. The second major invention that's really going to change um, during the Industrial Revolution is the advent of the steam engine. So steam engines had been around since ancient Greece. So they've been around for several thousand years. Mackenzie, Mackenzie. 
So steam engines had been around since ancient Greece, and they are really an important thing that people are using to generate electricity and energy. So steam engine is basically taking the power of heat and transferring that power into motion. So you're creating a heat source, you're burning usually coal, that coal is going to rise a piston up and down. And then during the industrial revolution, we're learning to take that up and down motion and turn it into a circular motion. And that circular motion is essentially going to allow things like you see down here in the bottom right in the textile looms, the power looms that start to become very popular during this time period. It's going to allow trains like you see up here to be produced. And it's going to allow oil wells like you see right here to start pulling oil out of the ground. So those two things um, are really going to change the world. All right. All right. So your first notes are going to be about capitalism. So capitalism. So when we get to these spots, you guys have um, in your notes, you've got right here up at the very top, it'll say, explain capitalism, put your answer here. So you guys are going to write down about capitalism. Okay. All right. So capitalism is let's get, an economic and political system where trade and industry are owned by private people, not by the government. So that's the definition you're going to write down. Capitalism is an economic and political system where trade and industry are owned by private people, not by the government. So capitalism is what we have today for most of the world. There are a couple exceptions where we have um, communism or socialism, which are different forms of government you guys learned about in sixth grade. But capitalism is the predominant type of government and economy that we have in the world today. And capitalism basically means that private industry, private individuals are in charge of making money and products. And during this time period, about 1750, we really start to see capitalism take hold in um, the United States, in England, and in Europe. And it's really going to revolutionize the way that people live their lives. So we're going to see the rise of merchants, of factories, and people are going to be less um, dependent on a king, a queen, or some other sort of nobility for their livelihood. This will really give rise to different types of people, more, more classes of people. Um, we're also going to see the rise of what's called laissez-faire economics, which means hands-off economics. And hands-off economics means that there's limited to no government influence or interference in the economy. And that's largely what we have today in the United States. The United States government is largely hands-off of industry, although some people may argue that, but we have a very, um, limited role in the economy as a government, unlike other countries where the government is much more involved in the economy. All right. So hopefully everybody got this down. The other free, the other important one is free enterprise. And this is allowing people to buy, sell and trade goods however they wanted. Okay. So those are the two definitions that you guys are going to need. So free enterprise allowed people to buy, sell, and trade goods however they wanted. Okay, so the Industrial Revolution, the beginning of it, is really going to be in allowing people to make products in factories instead of being made by hand. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, we have what's called the cottage industry. And the cottage industry is basically people are producing products that they need in their own homes. So, you know, if you need a shirt, you are going to make that shirt or your mom is going to make the shirt for you. But you're not going to go to a store to buy that shirt. And then if you're lucky enough to have some excess cotton or some excess wool at the end of your, you know, farming cycle, like when you brought all the farm products in, then you're going to make a shirt or two extra to sell at market. But we don't really see people mass producing clothing until the industrial revolution when this textile boom really takes off. And that's going to be the kind of thing that drives this change. It'll be the catalyst or the impetus for the change is the ability to make lots of new clothing. 
So as we get these factories up and running, we are able to start producing these goods a lot more cheaply. So the price of products goes down as the supply goes up, right? And that's that basic law of supply and demand. When you have a high supply of something, the demand goes down, the pr prices go down. And so we're going to see this in the industrial revolution, and it's going to allow a lot more people to access things like clothes or finished goods from factories. And this is all really going to start because of a series of inventions that happened in Great Britain and eventually spread to the United States. And it's kind of interesting, this spread is actually done by industrial espionage. The English were very much concerned about people stealing the steam engine technology and taking it to other countries. And so um, we have some spies who go to England to eventually get these this information. Okay, so on your sheet, you're gonna see the first invention is gonna be interchangeable parts by Eli Whitney. So you guys are gonna summarize what it says, the purpose and pros in that little summarizing part, okay? So interchangeable parts are a hugely important invention, and they're invented by this guy, Eli Whitney, who's a really important figure in history. He's going to invent not only this, but also he's going to invent the cotton loom. And he has a couple other inventions, but these are the two most important. So interchangeable parts are where pieces of a machine are produced identically. And this is going to allow you to replace broken parts by simply taking that part out and putting in a replacement for it. And this is going to lead to the mass production of goods in large amounts. So basically, rather than having each machine custom built for that specific purpose, people are going to start building massive amounts of these machines that are going to be used interchangeably. So, you know, you're going to build this giant power loom, which is going to make textiles or clothing pieces of cloth. And if part of that power loom breaks down, you can go to the store or to the person who built the power loom and get a new part to replace it. You don't have to build a whole new power loom, but these replacements of identical parts are going to transform people's ability to produce goods. It's really going to make it a lot easier to fix things. Um, we're also going to see this to happen with weapons. So there was a really big invention doing using this interchangeable parts with muskets and rifles. And this is going to allow militaries, um, armies to much more quickly fix problems when their firearms are broken. It's also going to allow them to kind of train everyone the exact same way because everybody is using the same rifle. So interchangeable parts are created by Eli Whitney. There are some problems that go along with this. So as we see the rise in manufacturing and the rise of using all of these interchangeable parts and the growth of factory, we're going to have some problems happen. And the main thing that's going to happen is little children mostly kids like your age or younger are going to be working in these factories. And as these parts need to be fixed on these looms and other um, factory equipment, it's usually the kids that are have small enough hands to get in there to go and fix them. And this is really dangerous. A lot of um, the machines like aren't really turned off. Um, it's a lot easier for the factories to replace a person than it is for them to replace a machine. And so we're going to see a lot of people end up getting hurt because of these machines well, where they'll lose an arm, they'll lose a hand. Um, and so this is one of those negative parts of having these um, large factories, and especially since they're staffed mostly by women and children. All right, the second um, major invention by Eli Whitney is the cotton gin. So the cotton gin is a hugely important invention and it is going to really transform the way that cotton is harvested. So you guys can see down here below, this is a cotton gin. And it's essentially a big um, crank that you turn around that has a metal wheel in it with a bunch of sp spikes inside of the metal wheel. And what the cotton gin is going to do is remove all of the little seeds that are in the cotton plant. So before what was happened when people would go out and pick cotton, mainly slaves, they would pick out all these bags of cotton. They'd fill up a, usually about a 50 pound bag. And then you'd have to go in and separate all the cotton by pulling it apart and pulling each seed out. 
And this really is a very time consume, pro consuming process. It takes a ton of time to remove all of these um, little seeds out. But the cotton gin is going to revolutionize that. Instead of having a bunch of people working to take the seeds out of the cotton, you're going to have one person turning the crank, and that crank is going to remove all of the seeds of cotton in it. Okay? So the cotton gin is going to really expand how quickly people are able to process cotton to then be sent to the mills. And so sometimes we think that this may have helped people, but in the end, it's going to end up hurting them. And we'll look at that in just a second. So if you're going to write a little summary, I would say the cotton gin cleaned the seeds out of harvested cotton. And that is going to be its main, um, main thing. It's going to make the cotton processing much quicker. So give you guys a second to get caught up with me. Do you guys get a definition down? Could get a thumbs up maybe okay yes all right cool oh let me go back so oh i can't go back so the negative part of the cotton gin was um although you you know it's going to make processing a lot more a lot quicker you're not going to need as many slaves to do this work it is really going to vastly increase the production of cotton in the south and it is going to lead to an explosion of the amount of slaves who are being used in these southern plantations so despite the fact that it makes this job easier it's actually going to end up leading to a huge increase in the number of slaves who are being used in the south to produce cotton so it definitely has some negative aspects to it okay so there are a couple more that you need to get down um, the steel plow was invented by John Deere, and the steel plow is a triangle-shaped tool used to till the soil. So you can see down here, this is a steel plow, and it is going to essentially cut through the soil and bring the bottom soil up. So the top soil is exposed, and this is a much more fertile soil that people will then use to farm with. We also have the mention of the mechanical reaper, which you can see a little bit down here. The mechanical reaper is going to cut wheat plants at the base and remove the wheat seeds from the stalk, which we eat the wheat seeds and then the wheat stalk is used to make hay. So this also greatly increases the speed that farmers can harvest their crops. So I'm going to go ahead and share those definitions with you because um, they're not as explained as much. So you can see here the three that we're talking about, the steel plow by John Deere is a triangle shaped tool used to till the soil. This is made plowing much faster and able to work on harder soil. The mechanical reaper was invented by Cyrus McCormick, and it's a machine used to remove the wheat stalk from the seeds, greatly increasing the productivity of the farmers. And the spinny jinny was invented by James Hargraves, and it's a machine that made it easier to make thread. So one person was able to do the work of eight. All right, so I'll give you a second to copy those three down, and then we will move on to the next one. All right, did you guys get these? Can you give me a thumbs up? Are we ready to move on? Nope. Okay, I'll give you one more, couple more seconds here.
Yeah, there will be a video in Canvas of the lesson. So you, if you miss any notes, you can just get it from the video, okay? All right, so we're going to keep going. Oops, wrong one. Okay, so there is some backlash to the invention of the cotton gin and the other, the mechanical reaper and the um, plow. So the main backlash, like I said to you earlier, is that as these inventions make it easier for farmers and um, plantation owners to produce these items, we're going to see a great expansion of slavery in the South. It's essentially going to make it much more profitable for them to own farms, and they're going to use this as a reason to expand the number of slaves that they own. And so this is really going to increase um, slavery in the South and make it much more of um a much bigger institution than it was before. So as we are making these advances in technology, even though it makes it easier and less work for the people who are involved in this, it's going to ultimately lead to an expansion of slavery in the southern states. Um, so the spinning jenny, like I mentioned before, this is a spinning jenny made by James Hargraves, and it's going to allow one person to make thread. So You'll see down here, these are some images of a spinning jenny. And it's essentially going to take cotton and you make the cotton much easier to turn into thread. So the cotton is going to come initially as a small plant. And then that plant, like the little cotton buds, are then going to have to be woven together and made into thread. Um, these most of the time are going to be produced in textile mills and women are going to become the main people who work in textile mills. So it's really going to, um, in some ways be a good thing for women because it's going to allow them to have jobs for some of the first times M prior to this, most women, women weren't allowed to work outside of the house. Um, but as we start to have these factories, a lot of the textile mills are going to employ women in them. Um, but in a negative way, the working conditions are pretty awful and women are being paid a lot less than men are. And there's also going to be a lot of children working in these. Um, Eliza How, Elias Howe is going to invent the sewing machine, and this is going to really increase how quickly people are able to sew. Prior to this, most of the time people are producing um, sewing, making clothes, and sewing other things by hand, which is a very time consuming and slow process. And the sewing machine is going to really increase the speed that people are able to produce clothes. We're also gonna have a huge transformation when Samuel Morse creates the telegraph. And the telegraph is our first high speed communication device. So it's going to allow um, almost instant communication from one coast to the other, and they're sending a series of little beeps that, that sound kind of like beep, 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 from along copper wires that have been stretched from one side of the country to the other. So you guys may have heard of SOS before, which is a three, series of three short beeps, followed by three long beeps, followed by three short beeps, which is save our ship. And this is going to be... Um, what's called Morse code invented by Samuel Morse. And that is what the telegraph is going to communicate with. So you'd have a person at one end of the line and you can see right down here, this is a device using it and they'd press down to send a beep. And then a person at the other end of the line would decode that message by listening to the number of beeps. And that would translate to a letter of the alphabet. But the telegraph is going to be crucially important because prior to this, if you wanted to send a message from New York to San Francisco, the only way that you were going to get that message there is by writing it out by hand and then having somebody carry it on horseback from the East Coast to the West Coast. The Morse code and the telegraph is going to allow people to communicate almost instantly. And so this is going to really be one of the things that revolutionized the world. Um, you're not able to call anyone. That's not going to happen until the early 1900s. But um, the telegraph is going to make communication much quicker. All right. So there are the two right here. So we've got um, the sewing machine by Elias Howe. So allowed sewing to be done by a machine instead of by hand, people could make clothes a lot faster. And the telegraph, which was a new form of communication where electrical signals were sent along copper wire. This made for near 
instant communications, a huge advancement. Okay. So I'll give you guys a second to get those two copied down. Okay. All right. So the next two inventions are going to be the Bessemer steel process. And this is created by Henry Bessemer. And it's going to allow for the first mass production of steel to be produced. So steel is when we take iron and we combine it with carbon. Usually that's done by using coal to um, melt the iron and the carbon from the coal makes its way into the iron to create steel. But the Bessemer steel process is going to be one of the first advancements to making steel much more quickly produced. Um, steel is going to be really essential for these factories and producing um, higher quality metal that's going to be used in the machines. Before this, the main metal that was being used was iron, and iron is really brittle, so it breaks easily. But steel is a much stronger metal, so it's going to allow for a lot more machines to be used and for those machines to be used more effectively. So the Bessemer steel process is just a mass production process for producing steel. The second invention um, is probably the most important, which is steam power. So like I mentioned earlier, steam had been used by um, people from the ancient Greeks. And it had been known that we could take the power of steam, so essentially the power of heat, and convert that into making um, a mechanical motion. But this, the like advancements in the steam engine that are done during this period are going to greatly increase the productivity of the heat. So we're going to be a lot more efficient at it. And it's going to allow for the invention of things like steam powered engines, which are going to be used on trains. It's going to be used in producing factories. So powering powered looms, if you're, if people are not using rivers to power them and railroads. And so these expansions are really going to change the way that goods are transported from farm to market throughout the United States. It's going to allow for um, goods to be produced in the Midwest and then brought to New York, which is going to essentially transform New York into a manufacturing center for the United States because we're able to bring those products there. So steam power is going to be really essential for, um, for this happening. Um, Robert Fulton, this guy on the left, is going to invent steam-powered ships. So you guys have probably seen pictures of these before. They're called paddle wheel ships. Um, they're very common along the Mississippi throughout the 1800s. And they're going to be a really important way for cotton to be brought to market and then transported from New Orleans, which was the main port for cotton production, to Europe, places like England, where it's then made into textiles or clothing. Um, this is going to really increase our trade as a nation with other countries because these ships are a lot faster. They don't have to wait for wind, right? If you have a sailboat and it stops 
there's no wind, then you're essentially just stuck there. But the powered ships, the steam powered ships were able to continue on and they were also a lot faster. So it's going to really revolutionize that. Steam power is also going to be used in factories. Um, it allows factories to be built in different places. Prior to this, factories are going to be only built along rivers because they're going to use that mechanical motion of the river, the current, to make the machines work. But after this, factories are really going to be able to be placed anywhere because they're going to use the steam, powered, um, steam power to make that same motion so it's going to really revolutionize where factories are able to be built all right so let's get these last couple ones down i guess there's only these last two so we got the bessemer steel process which is a new steel forging process allowed for much faster production of steel steam power by robert Fult made by robert fulton is a machine that transforms the power of heat into usable energy and heat pushes up a piston, which then drives the machine. Okay, so this um, canal video is not working, so I just deleted that question number three, which was asking about the canal. And you can also delete question number four. How did the, or, you know, we'll just answer this one together. How did the Erie Canal help man fulfill manifest destiny? So I answered this um, just a second ago. And what the Erie Canal is going to do is it's going to um, help transport massive quantities of stuff from the Midwest into New York and other markets much more easily. So this transformation is going to mean that New York state becomes a really important manufacturing zone for the United States. So essentially the Erie Canal is a waterway that is built from the Midwest to New York. Um, so they went and they dug out the ground, filled it with water, and then transportation ships are able to float along there from one end to the other to bring goods to market. Now, I don't think we're going to have time to go through the last two slides. So if you guys want to copy down these last three slides, you can do that. Um, and then that will be it. So once you get these last three done, you can get out of here. 